because it's just weird. Hello? Why use two when I can only hear from one? You what? Yeah, <laughs> Why use so. two when I can only hear from one? Da, 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 da. Let me see. I think we're about to be live. Hi, can Christine and Anne and John and Sarah and Gringo. Oh my God, I actually, Gringo, I have a question from you and I'm going to be answering it. Can you guys hear me? Can you please press yes if you can hear me? Good morning, everybody. Hi, oh, Maria Costa. Is that you, my darling one from Jersey? Hi, Irvin. Hello. Oh, I guess Maria. Yes, you can hear me. Oh, what can we do off seasons to attract guests? We will do a webinar about off season um, hosting in January. Hello, Brooklyn, Eva, Nikki. All right. So um, it is 201 and very promptly we are going to start our webinar so that I can respect your time and we could just take advantage as much as possible. So my first thing that I would like to tell you is my little disclaimer. Uh, first of all, hello everyone. Thank you for joining my first hosting one-on-one -on -one webinar. And first of all, the disclaimer is, this is not an Airbnb sponsored event. Airbnb knows about the webinar, but this is all my opinions. And I have many. I am honored that you have taken the time to be here. I live in Brooklyn, New York and been hosting since 2010. And like many of you, I started hosting because of the economy. In my home, I have two types of listings. I share space with guests. They have, I have a private bedroom. And I also have a private apartment that is completely separate. Um, because of that, I've been hosting, I'm going to say about over 100 people a year or so. I'm booked about 95% of the times. I have also stepped up on behalf of the sharing economy and Airbnb and spoken to the press and done numerous things for Airbnb and the sharing economy. I believe in it. I saved my life. So um, if you want to read a little bit more, you could go to my website and there's a little bit more information and press articles and things like that. So um, there's a couple of questions and, and the first thing that I would like to tackle is pricing. And I think this is one of the biggest things and one of the most important things. So let me um, just scroll over to a little presentation about pricing that I wrote. And it's right here. So, um, as you can see, this is um, we're going to talk a little bit about the pricing and what is happening. So I don't know if you know your minimal and your emotional price. And Mr. Leon, how do you find your best price for your apartment? So the question is this: I have two listings, like I told you before. The private apartment for me, I could get it with the long-term tenant to be rented at. $2,500 a month, all right? It's about $2,000 without furniture. With furniture and utility, it's actually $2,800. If I was to just rent it out to a long-term tenant, now, if I was to divide that $2,800 by 30 days, that's equal to less than $94 per night. Now, do I feel comfortable and renting my beautiful apartment for less than $100 per night? No. My current price is actually $170 for the first guest, and then I charge per additional guest. I also charge a cleaning fee. 
So when the slow season happens and I have to lower, lower my prices and slash it, my emotional price is actually 125 or so, where I feel like I'm still, I'm not giving it away. I'm getting some money. But mind you, I could go down as low as $100 a night and I will break even. If in the month of January or February, I'm making $2,500 to $2,800 for that month, I know that I'm doing better or I'm doing just as good as if I was renting to a long-term tenant, okay? Now, that's my emotional price. The whole problem is, excuse me, is that the space is empty. So it's costing me money. I do not, I have an old house and I cannot divide the heat. So I still need to heat the entire home. I pay a mortgage regardless whether I have someone there or not. Um, um, it's everybody okay? Can everybody hear? Just say, press a little yes. Anybody? Hi from Colorado, Christine, John, Sarah. Um, so we were talking about pricing. So this emotional pricing of $125 where I feel comfortable that I'm not giving away my space. And then that's the reality, which is have I rented my space before for um, less than $100? Yeah, I have because I need the money. It pays my bills. Okay, so now we're going to start uh, answering some questions. And I have a lot of questions from before that you guys ask. And I'm going to um, go to start with those questions now. All right. So now, um, Tanya from Kansas asks, what magic do you use to keep your room so full? Um, and by the way, Tanya, if you're here, can you say hi? I would love to make sure that you, I am answering your question. Hello, Tanya? All right, John, Christine, it's the last things I'm getting. I don't know why I'm not getting any more responses. But Tanya, um, the magic to use to keep the, the room so full, it has to do a lot with pricing and also the experience that you give to your guest. Um, my prices are very competitive with the neighborhood. They're actually a little bit on the lower side. I could probably get a little bit more, but I want to be booked. Um, I've decided beforehand how much money I need to make a month. So I have a budget and I know like I need to make so much money. And that's one of the reasons why um, my prices are a little bit more lower. And that's why I'm so booked all the time. Um, the space that shares with me starts at $100 a night. And that shit has a private bedroom and a private living room. They're so getting a lot for $100 a night. But that's for the first guest. Um, and it's enough. Can I go a little higher? Probably. But I probably will not be booked as much. And the difference in pricing between what I'm getting a month and, excuse me, what I'm getting and whether I'm booked or not, it's too small. In addition, there is a, a value perception if i'm charging let's say 150 dollars for a one a private bedroom you might want more than what i have and you might ding me on my reviews and say well it was 150 dollars but it's worth 150 dollars they don't have a private bathroom they're sharing the bathroom with me they're sharing space with me and there's other apartments that you could get a studio apartment here for 150 dollars so why would they want to get a, a bedroom that they share so think about your pricing and your um, the value. So can I get a little bit of response from the group and make sure that um, everybody can listen and everything else? Because I'm not seeing anyone. Hello? Just muted myself. Hello? Hello, people. Anybody? Can they? Anyone? My last message I got is from John and Christine. Can everyone hear me? Oh. 
Zoom me. I'm going to text one of you. Oh, there's something. Hi. Hi, Colorado, Christine, John. It's, it's still the same. All right, I'm going to continue answering um, text thinking that you can all hear me. I'm actually going to be texting a person that's on the group. Maria, I am texting you if you can hear me. I just want to confirm that I am heard. Um, and so my other question that I got was, how, um, Andrea from Boston had a question about a streamlining the process. Another host is using her listing as a backup suggestion. And that is a great thing because when you have empty days and someone else is booked all the time, they could just throw a little bit of stuff towards you. Now, so my question to her, to my, to Andrea is, is the guest paying the other host? If you're having, if you're having your space and you're overbooked and you're sending it over to somebody else, all you have to do is send the link, let it go straight to that host and the payment process and everything goes to that host. In addition, your 1099 and your taxes will not be reporting income that you're not getting. And you want to make sure that all of that is straight. If you want to, for it to give them uh, uh, some money, what you could do is for that particular payout, just give them a finder's fee. All right? So that was Andreas from Boston is how can I streamline the prices? All right? Now, Jennifer from Australia, which I'm dying to go, is um, very often I have guests that want to come and see my space. The, she has this amazing house. She, she, I was lucky to see her listing beforehand. I'm sorry, Donna, can, you, you cannot hear anything. Um, oh, yes, you can hear me. Thank you, guys. So Jennifer has a beautiful space in Australia, very much a center space for wedding invitations. She even has like this beautiful pool. It is really, really gorgeous. Um, and a lot of people want to come in and see this space beforehand. And so my answer to Jennifer is, do you have a separate website beyond Airbnb? And that's going to be my question to all of you guys, hosts that are out there and listening to me right now. Do you have a, des a specific website beyond Airbnb that you can have your um, potential guests go to, get some information? I have had numerous people come wanting to see the space and believe me, I'm sort of like, why do you want to see it? The pictures are there. I have amazing reviews. So why do you still want to see it? But we have to put ourselves in the position of the guests that they're fearful. They might be renting for their parents. They might be renting for people that are coming for a wedding or graduation and they're afraid. This We're working with a fearful sentence here. So. I do allow them to come and see it, um, but I do tell them that they need to still book through Airbnb, okay? So um, just to let you know, you could, you know, there is a system you could ask Airbnb to set it up as well, but I just let the person know, look, you could come in and see the space, you could, you know, review it. I do, you know, if I have guests, I have to work it out with the guests and everything else, and just tell them, I just need to, you know, you. You're gonna pay me through Airbnb, especially first time guests. I do not like collecting anybody out of the system, okay? So another question, and this is from David. He did not have a listing yet, so I don't know where he's coming from, but he asked me, should breakfast always be an option? He has a small refrigerator, a microwave, and a coffee machine in the room, and they also have access to the main floor common areas. So. About having a kitchen and about offering breakfast, it really depends on your style of hosting. What is it that you're offering? Are you comfortable with your guests using your kitchen? Some people are not. I'm talking to you, Lou. You know that you hate people using your kitchen, moving things around, being in there when you're cooking, and it happens to me, believe me. Sometimes I'm okay with it, and sometimes I have to take a deep breath and go outside somewhere else and eat someplace else because my guests are sort of invading my kitchen. Excuse me. For the most part, I don't have a problem. 
I do offer some um, breakfast items. I think it's important to at least offer coffee and tea. And your cover, you have a small refrigerator in the space so that you could even provide them with some yogurts. I have a friend who's a host and she does not have a kitchen in their space, but she gives them some yogurt, tea, coffee, a little bit of milk, and they, they still have something to eat, all right? So don't forget um, the tea, please. Now, another question is, this was from Robin from Arkansas. She's asking, how do I know I'm giving relevant information without overwhelming my guest? Their place is unique and is remote and uses solar rain water, and it takes time to get to know. How much is too much information, and when do I become a hovering hostess? Actually, and, and I want to say this, they had an amazing, amazing photo. I'm going to ask them if I could share the listing with you guys because it was beautiful. Their setting is just, their first photo for, felt like a painting, and I actually want to know how was it that they accomplished that. Um, in reference of giving too much information to your guests, remember that your guests do not know your house. They don't know, like, I have a bathroom where the tub, it's very, very old house. I have, it's over 100 years old. And for you to fill it up, it has a little thing on the side. It's not on the top. It's a, it's a little thing on the side. I actually had to take pictures of it because people will think that, oh, my God, I overflowed in the, the tub. It's stuck. And it was just that the, you have to do it manually. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I needed to provide that information to my guests because they didn't know. Um, if you have anything specific in your house that is very important, put some little frames, type up the information. Like I have a frame here where it sort of says, please lock both doors. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, we just stayed, uh, we went to the Airbnb open conference in San Francisco and we stayed at this beautiful house over there. There was about six super hosts out from New York and we stayed together. And the host, not only did she label all her cabinets, so we're not opening doors and not knowing where the plates are, or where the cups are at. And she was really great about that. But she also had little labels in the bathroom because of the drought. So she was letting us know, please conserve the water or how to use the washing machine and things like that on top of also having it on a guidebook, okay? So if you have very important information, repeat, repeat, repeat. It's better, to, for, it's better to give too much than omission, okay? And believe me, not everybody reads the guidebook. It's, it's a known fact. Um, I have another question from Kathy from Portland, and she asks, I've never had a bad guess. But as a single woman living in my home, my family asked me, what will I do if that happens? Can you walk me through the process to follow if a guest of host is feeling it's not a match once they arrive? I'm also a single woman and I live alone in my home and I totally understand the concerns of hosting as a single woman. Um, I have another friend who also hosts and she's a single woman and she's chosen to only host women. She does not want to have that feeling of um, thread or uncomfortable of being of living with a man in her house. I don't have a problem. I I really, I I, I really just don't care. Um, but that's just me. Not everybody feels comfortable. You have a choice to not accept a guest. Remember that you don't have to accept everybody that comes through and gives you an inquiry. So the, you have that power. Um, but if you have a guest in your house, that is it that they did they broke a rule, or is it that you just not feeling the love? Remember, they're going to leave. Thankfully, they're going to leave really soon. It happens. Um, and my friend loves to tell me not everybody's a love guest in your house. Which, excuse me, it happens. Not everybody I love. There's some guests where I am like really, really grateful for the presence and I love hosting them. And there's others that I'm like, yeah, I mean, you could come back, but eh. All right, so, you know, mind you, if there's a guest that's breaking rules, if there's a guest where you're not feeling comfortable, I would say call Airbnb, let Airbnb know, 
and they will tell you to probably contact the police and to contact the authorities. If you feel threatened in your home, if you don't feel safe, this is your life and you do not need to feel like that in your own home. They are guests after all, okay? So please be safe, and but remember that you do not need to accept every single guest that says yes. All right, so I have a question from Susan from Los Alamos, and she's asking, I'm new to Airbnb. She first listed in mid-October, which is like, yay. And so far, her experience has been fantastic. She keeps waiting for the other shoot to drop. And then with that in mind, I guess my question is, what am I missing? So my answer to that is the shoe will drop and be prepared. For the most part, people are good. And there's some guests you love and others that you love to see go. Um, her home was beautiful and amazing um, and everything else. And I think if you just prepare for a review that is not stellar, for a guest that you might have some difficulties with it, believe me, hosting will show you to set up boundaries, to talk to people, to be diplomatic. Um, I'm still learning. I'm not the best. There's times that, you know, my guests know that they, I'm not happy with them and I'm a little bit too blunt. I blame that on being a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's all good, you know, but also remember that you are providing a space for someone. You're not just renting room. You, you are creating memories. You are in charge of someone's vacation, okay? Now, um, Jo from New Zealand, she asked, how can I capture the inquiry to confirm a uh, reservation? Um, unfortunately, I was not able to do a market analysis on her price, on her space. And my question to her was, um, she did not have any reviews. So it was like, she needs to um, lower her prices until she starts getting the five-star reviews. It is a process. Um, you might think that you could get $150 a night for your space, but your price and the market and what they're willing to pay for it is what's going to dictate it, okay? It, it, I've been hosting for four years. It took a long time for me to get here. Um, so how to respond to a negative review? This was from Lisa. And she hasn't had one yet, but she wants to be prepared. So, guys, I had a bad review once. I had a guest that did not like my home. We actually got into a little encounter. And she actually called Airbnb to close my account. Um, I probably did not handle it as best as I could. But that review is there. It will live on forever. Um, I wish I would have known then that I should have just taken my time, answer her concerns, and just let it go. Let it go. Airbnb did not close my account, thankfully. Um, they understood that this was just a guest that was complaining, um, but I had other stellar reviews from before. She had some validity on, on her opinions and stuff like that, and I actually corrected some stuff. Um, but sometimes you just got to breathe. Take, give yourself some time. 24 hours, 48 hours, do not respond to the negative review. Do not respond immediately. Don't go with that, you know, first reaction. Take the time and, and come back to it because what happens is your response to the review is going to live on. And what might happen is if this is a one bad review among 20 amazing reviews, your guest, the person that's inquiring and looking at your reservations and looking to inquire about your place, will probably know that this is just someone that is not the best Airbnb guest. You have to remember, Airbnb is for everyone, but not anyone can do it, okay? You have to have a very specific personality and able to handle criticism and able to handle customer service. We're dealing with people. And believe me, I know that not everybody wants to live with me, okay? Now, I got a great question, and this is from Gringo. And Gringo, I saw you in the chat before, and I hope you're still here. Please um, announce that you're still here because I really loved your question. So Gringo has um, a place in Fort Lauderdale, and he's, and, and I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this with my English, a naturist, naturist, he likes to walk around without clothes. So he wants to make sure that 
his guests realize this, that this op clothing is optional. So, so what he's asking me is, since I am a naturist and my home is always clothing optional, it's really important that guests realize this before they arrive. I cannot make anyone take the time to read all of my stuff, but how can I encourage them so that they share that there's no naked surprises upon their arrival? I loved him. So now, if you have something that is very important, whether it is that clothing is optional, that you have pets, that your steps are really high, you need to make sure your guests know this. The communication is clear from the beginning, that it is on your photos. And in one of the, the things that he had, he said, the backyard is still where most people want to chill because of the naked palms. Tiki hut and hot tub, outdoor shower or hammock. And I, went, I wanted to ask him, he had this as a caption, and I said, what can you say in there? You could be naked as well, like the, you know, like the naked palms. Um, so there has to be communication. If you have a clothing optional, if you have some steep steps, you need to, don't show the naked optional picture, but make sure that it's clear in the communication. Every email that you send to your guests, the first your first communication when the guest says, hey, I love your place. Are your dates available? And how much is it? Because they never know how to figure that out. You have to tell them, I'm glad I, you love my place. Please note that I am a clothing optional household. I want you to be comfortable with that. And if you are, we could proceed with this reservation. Like that, there's no surprises, gringo. I hope you're still on the chat and that I answered your question. So, um, Tom from Seattle, so he's asking me, what are your thoughts on homeowner's insurance coverage? And I say, get it. Um, luckily, right now, we have more options than we had in the past. So for the last three years, I was basically praying and hoping that nobody will break a leg or fall down the stairs. And believe me, whenever I had little babies in the house and kids and toddlers, I would be like crunching and burning more candles. Um, there's not a lot of options, but you need to have insurance. You need to have liability. I know that Airbnb is offering a liability insurance at the beginning of the years, but please read it and be careful with it. You need to make sure that it covers you. It also only covers you for Airbnb spaces. If you're renting via Airbnb, if you're renting with VRBO, if you're renting with HomeAway or FlipKey, and I imagine that you are on all those sites as well, you will not be covered. Um, I know Peers.org is offering a new liability insurance for $36 a month. This is not uh, me getting money from Peers, but go check it out. And I'm going to say go and look. Uh, my liability insurance right now, I'm covered with CBIZ. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a good Thing. I'm not overpaying a lot, I feel. It's just a little bit $300 more a year than what I used to pay for my previous insurance. And I have income interruption so that if, God forbid, something happens and I have to close down the house for a year and a half or so, I, excuse me, I get paid for that, okay? And by the way, Tom from Seattle, if you're still here, please show off your spot, like bathroom sooner. Um, your photos are amazing and that bathroom looks fantastic. So um, those are my answers to your questions for today. Um, I had someone else ask me, Leah from Oakland was asking me, I leave a welcome basket, um, but it comes out of her profit. It's a worthwhile. She was also has a well-stocked bar in the space and no one has abused it. Um, my concern with alcohol is to not have it in the guest space. I don't offer it. You don't know people's um, religion or sensitivity. You don't know if alcohol is a trigger or something like that. So I don't even offer a bottle of wine. I offer other things, but not wine. I offer, you know, I, I offer some breakfast items. And some people eat them and some don't. You need to look at your pricing structure and you need to make sure that you're okay with it, okay? So, you know, just be all of, on all of that. Now, so we have a minute to go. Um, I want to know if there's any more questions out there. I'm seeing Christine, John, Sarah. Um, and now I'm going to also share a little bit something else with you guys. So I have, um, 
this, um, it's my gift to you. I have a listing checklist and I'm going to send it to everybody that registered, whether they were present during the webinar or not, but I'm going to email it to you guys. And I'm also offering a 10% discount on the one-on-one -on -one consultation. Um, there's a coupon call. You could go to my website at evelynbadia.com and just you know click on it and use December webinar and you get a 10% discount for the holidays. Um, so we will be having monthly meetings like this starting January 2015. This was my first one and I'm so honored that you were here and I'm so happy that you were here. You have you guys have no idea. I just remember how you were the first time you had a guest and you were all nervous. That's how I was today. Believe me, I've been driving a whole group of people that have been supporting me and who I'm very grateful to, you know, uh, Paul from Puerto Rico who designed the website, um, Jorge, who our director, Marie, who put up with me, Catherine, who's here today, helping me out and making sure that I smile. <laughs> Whenever I look to the side, it's her telling me, smile. So I'm smiling for you guys because I'm a little nervous. Um, so again, Thank you really so much, guys. I hope this was of value to you. I'm going to be offering these webinars once a month. I'm also going to be offering some more in-depth webinar where we will talk about how to market yourself for the slow season. I know slow season is happening here on the East Coast right now, and a lot of people are feeling like, oh, my God, where did the guests go? Um, I'm prepping for that one. It's, it's a very in-depth web, uh, webinar. We will have a lot of information for you guys, but it's going to take me a little bit. I will give you more than a week of announcement to let you know. So thank you so much. Our time is up. I actually have guests arriving today that I have to go and clean for. And I will, guide, I will see you guys out there, okay? Hope you're well. Bye-bye.